Hey, Marilyn, how you doing over here? Pretty good. You about ready to go? Yeah. I'll... Let me check your mm -hmm. harness. Make sure it's double back. Yeah, that looks good. Too. This is going to be a little bit harder than anything you've done before, but I think you're going to be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> how you feeling? <laughs> I think I'll be able to. Decided to trust him. He gave me every reason to give up all my sin. I know what you're feeling. I've been there before. If you just let him in, he'll be waiting at the door. I got a reason to walk the street narrow. I got a reason to fire like a narrow. I got a life that's always worth living. You gotta come along. Should be running though you know you're standing still. You know you could be something if you only knew his will. Emotions running wild and you're chomping at the bit. Try to work the pieces, but they don't seem to fit. I know what you're feeling, I've been there before. If you just let him in, he'll be waiting at the door. I got a reason to walk the street. The question is, is safe sex really safe? In this age of AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases, what risk would premarital sex pose for you? In this video, Dr. James Dobson teams up with Dr. Joe McElhaney to give you the information you need to make wise choices. Let's join Dr. Dobson now as he prepares to unmask the myth of safe sex. A couple of years ago, I was appointed to the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Panel. It was a panel uh, represented by the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. And I accepted the responsibility because I thought their purpose was to try to prevent teen pregnancy. It seemed to make sense. Uh, there were 18 members of that panel chosen from universities and chosen from private life all across the United States. Fifth of the 18 I found when I got there, 15 of the 18 thought the answer to the problem of teen pregnancy and abortion and all those things was what? What do you think? Yeah, condoms. They thought safe sex was the answer. They thought that we ought to tell every teenager in America that they ought to have lots of really good sex, only they ought to do it right. They ought to do it with a condom. That's the position of the federal government, or at least certain departments within it. And I resigned in protest because I strongly disagree with that for reasons that you're about to hear. Now, I invited a guest to be with us tonight, a man that uh, is a personal friend of mine and one of the nation's um, foremost authorities on sexually transmitted disease and on uh, many of the things that we're going to be talking about. He wrote this book. Sexuality and Sexually Transmitted Diseases. It's an excellent book. I recommend that you not only read it, but pass it around to your friends who haven't gotten a message on this subject yet. Uh, the author is Dr. Joe McElhaney. Dr. McElhaney is a physician in private practice in Austin, Texas. He is an obstetrician and a gynecologist in private practice, and he speaks in public schools, and he's, uh, as I said, become an authority on this subject and has been on Focus on the Family's radio program. You may have heard him. He's been there 10 or 12, 14 times. And it is a pleasure to have him here. Would you help me welcome Dr. Joe McElhaney?
Dr. McElhaney, appreciate you being here. You flew over from Austin to be with us uh, tonight just for this purpose. Uh, you said in this book of sexuality and sexually transmitted diseases that we're involved now in an epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. What do you mean by that? An epidemic is an infectious uh, disease that's widespread, that's uh, affecting many, many people. There's no specific number to how many people it affects, but if it's a disease that's affecting a lot of people uh, in a particular group of people, it's an epidemic. Now, I understand that uh, there are somewhere around 35 to 38 sexually transmitted diseases that are just rampant across the United States and around the world. Uh, this is not the way it was five or ten years ago. Things are really changing in that area, aren't they? Uh, tell us what are the most common ones. Well, the most common diseases that are uh, seen in this country are the two diseases, chlamydia and HPV, or the human papillomavirus infection. Now, I would venture to say that, that uh, a lot of you uh, have heard of those but don't know much about them. Uh, but these two diseases are just really dangerous. Uh, but then herpes has been around for about the past 10 years in epidemic proportions, too. Uh, AIDS is becoming a really uh, well-known disease by all of us because it kills people. Uh, but we have just innumerable other diseases that many of them people haven't even heard of. Let's throw some uh, statistics at people. Uh, chlamydia, what percentage of the uh, people who are sexually active, uh, we'll say college students today, what percentage have chlamydia, women particularly? The studies that I'm seeing right now from college campuses are that generally 30 to 35 to 40 percent of sexually active single people are infected with chlamydia with that one infection alone, which is uh, a very dangerous infection. The HPV organism is the organism that is causing more infection than any other infection that we're seeing in our offices right now. And we can talk about the dangers of that. It's a terribly dangerous infection. All right, when, when you add these up now, you have a, a fairly high percentage with chlamydia, a fairly high percentage with syphilis now. It's my understanding that syphilis is at a 40-year high, that the rate of syphilis now is just about where it was before penicillin was discovered. That's right. A 70% increase in the last three years or so. Over a period of three or four years, it went up almost 70%. I mean, this thing and, is rampant. And just, just this week, I read that the incidence of congenital syphilis has gone up 20 times uh, since the, the, the incidence was measured back in the early 70s. 20 times as many babies being born with syphilis. Now, you and I talked a few minutes ago about the fact that when syphilis is not treated, it looks like it goes away. That's right. But it continues in the body and then causes uh, mental illness. Uh, they used to call it dementia praecox, but this mental illness at uh, 50, 60 years of age. So you've got this huge increase in the number of people with syphilis. That's right. The commonest reason for admission to what used to be called insane asylums, mental institutions, back in the 30s were the complications of neurosyphilis. Uh, that's why most people were put in uh, those type of places back then. And this infection now is back at a 40-year high, which means we're going to be seeing among people that didn't know they had syphilis, uh, this horrible neurosyphilis that is going to be causing tremendous damage to these people. And it does the same thing to all those babies that are being born with that infection, too. For instance, uh, one of my associates just this last month had a baby that was born. Uh, the, the woman had, was a negative for her syphilis test when she got pregnant, uh, when she came into his office. But at the time of delivery, they did another syphilis test. It was positive. They found the baby had syphilis in its spinal fluid, and they had to put the baby in the hospital for 10 days to be treated. Just a horrible situation. Uh, Joe, how many years have you been in private practice? 23 years. 23 years. Yeah. You've seen some changes take place in that period of time, haven't you? Lots and lots of changes, especially in this area, Jim. What was it like 23 years ago? How commonly did a woman come into your office and have a sexually transmitted disease 23 years ago? I almost never saw it literally almost never saw it. We did see occasional older women who had uh, precancerous changes on their pap smear that we now know is caused by the HPV organism. But as far as uh, the instance of gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and this is with me having a large practice from the University of Texas because I'd worked at the Student Health Center mm -hmm. and we almost never saw it even among the co-eds at this Student Health Center. That All right, what's it like today? Today it's a totally different thing. In 76, 
was the first report about the chlamydia germ infecting the fallopian tubes and, and possibly being a cause of infection of fallopian tubes, causing PID in women. That came out of Sweden. PID is pelvic, pelvic inflammatory, inflammatory disease. disease. And there are a number of sexually transmitted diseases that cause that. Yeah, two, gonorrhea and chlamydia basically are those two. Today we're seeing chlamydia in our offices all the time and the results of PID. I saw a lady just this last week that had been having pelvic pain for one month. Uh, she'd had three sexual partners, the present one she'd been with for about six months. Didn't even know she had it. Came in with pain and, and she, of course, could end up being sterile as a result of that infection. We're seeing this infection and people have been sexually active uh, a great deal. Uh, for instance, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, 46% uh, of the co-eds that were tested there in their uh, student health center were infected with HPV virus. 46%, I did not misquote, and that came straight from the Student Health Center there in a study done, or that was reported just this year. These infections are absolutely everywhere. If anyone has sex outside of marriage with someone who's had sex before, you, they, will almost always get a sexually transmitted disease. Now, you're saying that it isn't necessary to be uh, loose, to sleep around, to have sex with many people, to encounter these diseases, that if you have sex with one or two people per year, who have sex with one or two people per year, you are essentially, as far as the viruses and the other organisms are concerned, having sex with the combined number that all the people had sex with. Is that correct? That's All exactly those viruses right. are there. They stay alive. Not only the viruses do, but chlamydia does, the gonorrhea does, the syphilis does. Let me just say something. Uh, the bacteria, all these germs will be there. And in a sense, we could say that if you have sex with someone, you're having sex with anybody that ever had sex with before. As far as those germs are concerned, unless one of those people in that line before actually did get treated for that infection before you had sex with them. Now, the problem is, though, that 60, 70 to 80 percent of people who have these infections have absolutely no idea that they're infected at all. So when uh, a young man tells a woman, uh, I don't have a sexually transmitted disease, he may or may not. In other words, he may not know that he carries it. Well, he, he very likely won't know that he carries it because again, from 60 to 80 percent of times of any, with any of these infections, he won't know he has it. And he may be totally honest with a girl in saying, look, I don't have a sexually transmitted disease. I'm safe and you can have sex with me and be okay. Uh, the other problem is, though, that we have some statistics that really show very strongly that guys and girls, too, frequently lie about their past sexual experiences, even if they're having sex with somebody else right now, that they'll often lie about that, too. Now, I would like you to, uh, to give us a little information, especially about the human papillomavirus, uh, HPV which I understand would be getting headlines if it were not for HIV, for AIDS. Yeah. Uh, HPV also causes death That's in right. a certain percentage of the people, but you're not hearing it. Describe it. Well, the HPV organism, it's a human papillomavirus, is a, a type of virus that infects the genitalia of both men and women. Uh, in men, uh, it causes little bitty warts that frequently aren't seen. I was talking to the urologist during this past month and they said that usually they can't see those those little warts on men very well and it's because men's external genitalia are sort of dry and they don't grow very fast there but they're there. If a man is uncircumcised and has that infection he does have a chance of getting penile cancer later on. It is the cause of cancer of the penis which isn't a very common cancer, true. But it does happen. But it does happen. And that's bad cancer guys. You know, we'd all agree. I uh, think they believe you. I, I wouldn't want to. Okay. Uh, girls, too. Uh, okay, so for men, it's not that bad unless you get that particular problem. But they carry the organism, and they often don't know it's there. And they pass it to women when they have sex with them. And again, it's one of those that they really don't know they have. But women pick this, this virus up very easily, and it causes venereal warts in a great number of people that get it. Venereal warts are a terribly aggravating infection. Uh, the little warts are, are bothersome. They drive women nuts. They come in, we use the laser, we use cautery, we use podophilin, we use uh, TCA, trichloroacetic acid, and freezing. And the reason we have all of these different treatments is because so often the treatment doesn't work and we end up spending money and time and it's a real pain. Now the big problem with HPV is 
though, that it's the cause of cancer of the vulva, vagina, and cervix. Now, these cancers in women have become just rampant. We never saw these, in, these uh, cancers in, in young women before these past few years, but we're seeing cancer of the cervix all the time in young women. As a matter of fact, up until two years ago, it was causing more deaths per year than AIDS was, and running around 6,800 a year in the past few years. So it's a deadly, right. deadly cancer, Jim. And it's called human papilloma. HPV. Right. Uh, I have a letter here from a woman who has this, and she wrote to me and asked me to do what we're doing right here. She wrote and asked if we would warn other women especially about HPV because she hadn't heard about it and she contracted it. This is what she wrote. While I fully acknowledge my grave error and sin and suffer for it daily, I feel that someone like you must warn the teenagers, the single young adults, and anyone else contemplating a sexual encounter that they will later regret it. The government and the media have thoroughly communicated about AIDS. That is not what this letter is all about. I'm writing about my concern over what the HPV virus can do. In one of your broadcasts, you covered the fact that it can give cervical dysplasia, leading to cancer of the cervix in teenagers. Certainly, that's tragic. It has many other effects that I have not read anything about. At this point, I'd like to give a few personal details about myself. I'm a 25-year-old college graduate. I've remained single and childless. The last four years of my life have been lived with chronic pain, two outpatient surgeries, multiple office biopsies, thousands of dollars in prescriptions, and no hope. The effect of this problem is one of severe, relentless infection. This condition can be so severe that the pain is almost unbearable, and a sexual relationship or the possibility of marriage is out of the question. The isolation is like a knife that cuts my heart out daily. Depression, rage, and hopelessness, and a drastically affected social and religious life are the result. While I may not be one of the success stories, I am managing to survive, and it is my hope and prayer that someone will make this awful condition as well known as AIDS. Physicians say they are seeing this condition more commonly. Females are being sentenced to a life of watching others live, marry, and have babies. Please take what I have said to the airways. Thank you for listening, Dr. Dobson. It is my hope to meet you someday and tell you of the victories I have attained. My life is a story within itself. However, this obstacle has been the one that I cannot gain victory over. Are you hearing stories like that? Jim, Why I is this not in the press? Why are we not hearing this on television? I think that we don't hear it because physicians really don't know what to do with it, and I think that educators don't know what to do with it, and when people don't know what to do with something, they tend not to talk about it. Uh, I got a call from a guy in Arizona who had had this same problem for seven years. They'd been doing biopsies of his penis, of the skin of his penis, and treating it with cautery for seven years. He said, Dr. McElhaney, it's driving me nuts. He said, I'd like to get married. I'm 33 years old, but I feel like I can't because I've, I've had this problem so long. And we're seeing that all the time. Look, when you hear something like this and the kind of thing I'm saying, you can feel it, that, that there's too much drama, that it really couldn't be that bad, and that your friends haven't told you they're having this kind of problem. I'm saying it's present in 30 or 40 percent of your sexually active friends, and they're not telling you that. But believe me that this letter's right and what we're saying is true. Uh, the most common thing I hear people say who are talking the way we're talking here today is, We'd sure like to save those kids from this kind of problem or save those young people from this kind of problem. But their answer is safe sex. Their answer is safe sex. I know how you feel Ours about is that. Different. That's right. Talk about safe sex. I saw a, an advertisement on, on TV one day, and uh, there was this really sad-looking lady. I mean, if she didn't have uh, AIDS, she sure looked like she did, but she really was so sad, and she said, look, if you don't want to have AIDS, use condoms. And it made me furious because I knew that what she was saying was, kids, just go out and use condoms and you're okay. All you have to do is just use condoms and you're safe. In a program uh, in New York City where there were a bunch of sex educators, some of the top people in the country, um, the lecturer started talking about this. She said, now, 
I want to know how many of you in this audience, you people know all about sexually transmitted disease, you teach it all the time, how many of you knowing that if someone had AIDS, they were the person you'd lusted for for 15 years and this person finally said they'd have sex with you. And just before you went into the room with them, they said, now, by the way, I have AIDS. I didn't tell you that before. How many of you would have sex with that person just trusting the condom to protect you? And not one person in that audience raised their hand until a little bit later, one person way in the back did. Uh, so people that know the truth about this stuff would not trust a condom to protect them from somebody who Why they not? knew had AIDS. Why not? The reason they won't is because, first, the federal government approves condoms. In a batch of condoms, four per thousand have holes in them. There are recent studies that show that a huge number of condoms rupture and break and leak when they're actually used in human beings. The tests they do uh, when they test condoms at the companies are done with these sterile machines that don't wear and tear, so the condoms break. And I'm sure all of you have been exposed to these illustrations about how to use a condom. It shows the erect penis and it rolled on just right and it held at the base when it's taken off and, and no leakage and all this stuff. And it always says on there, don't expose them to sunlight, don't expose them to cold, protect them just right. And nobody does it that way. They okay? tend to put them in the billfold and leave it there. That's what does right. that do to the... It destroys them and they break. Yeah. Okay, so first, they're manufactured with holes in them. Second, very few people use them right. Uh, third, I have not ever seen any study anywhere with a higher use of than 50%. But when you start looking at those studies, you find that really only 6 or 8% of people in those studies say they use them all the time. So that means the 50% that use them are missing them and just not using them when they don't feel like it. Mm. Married people... Yeah. You know, in our day and age when that was only contraceptive, we didn't like condoms because we knew that 20% of women per year got pregnant. Now, you can only get pregnant girls one 24-hour period. That's how long the egg lives after it's released from your ovary. Per month. One 24-hour period per month. And yet, a sexually transmitted disease is there 24 hours a day all the time. And yet, 20 to 25% of people get pregnant using condoms, for, even for birth control. Do you guys catch that now? Because pregnancy can only occur in one 24-hour period per month, and yet those that use condoms to prevent pregnancy have a 20% failure rate per year. Now, you take that one day and you expand it to 30 days or 31 days per month that you can catch a sexually transmitted disease, and you're expecting the condom to prevent them. You know what they call people who use condoms to prevent babies? What? Parents. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wh why do they lean on condoms so? Why, why is that the answer that the so-called liberated mind is coming up with for people this age? I, they know I, the statistics you just gave. Sure, they know the statistics. They think that if we can just fill your minds more and more with condom ease that we can get you to use them okay so they think that in a group this size if we can increase the rate of condom usage from forty percent to sixty percent we've saved some people they're saying you all are gonna all have sex anyway believe me that's what they think the people that are teaching about this in schools and colleges are saying every one of you kids are gonna be having sex soon and if we can just get you to use condoms we'll save some people but for you as an individual they're not talking to you they, they really don't know what to do with you as an individual. They're talking national statistics. They're talking statistics and overall percentages. They say we can cut the sexually transmitted disease rate down so much. But for themselves, when it comes to the question, will you have sex with somebody if that person has AIDS, they wouldn't do it for in a million years because they know they can get the infection from the other person. Uh, and yet they will protect that, that uh, right, if you will. There's something wrong with that. And that's why your blood pressure goes up when they start talking about safe sex. Have you noticed they're changing now? They start talking Safe. safer sex. That's, right. that's what you're going to hear. Safe sex, well, they, they can't defend that anymore, so they're talking about safer sex. That's right. Well, when you're talking AIDS and where the consequences are death, and in HPV, the consequences for many are death, um, safer for whom? I hope that you can hear what we're saying, and we're really not trying to lay it on you and manipulate you. These things that we're saying you can find in medical literature. This is not uh, just uh, Dr. Dobson's ethic or my ethic. What we're trying to say is this material is truth. It's fact. 
And if you choose to have sex, there is no safe way to do it. Joe, what does it do to you as a physician when the um, pathology report comes back and you've got to sit down with a 16-year-old woman and you've got to say, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but um, you know, there's cancer here. And uh, at an early age, before she's had a chance to bear children, she may have a hysterectomy and who knows where it goes mm -hmm. from there. What's that do to you? Well, it just makes me cry for that, for that person because she's crying at the same time while we're talking. Let me tell you about a patient I had just this week. It wasn't a cancer, but it was a patient that I did a, a laparoscopy on. That's where you make a little hole in the edge of your belly button and put a telescope in and look. This lady had been infertile. She'd had an x-ray that showed that both her tubes were blocked, but we thought maybe they were just obstructed right at the entrance from the, from the uterus. I did a laparoscopy, looked in, and her tubes looked like there had been molasses poured all over them. The fimbria, the delicate flower-like opening that receives the egg, was all destroyed. There was none of it there. Uh, the tubes were both enlarged about four times, five times their normal size. They looked like little wiener balloons sitting in there instead of the delicate little worm-like things that would be a fallopian tube. Um, I had her and her husband back in the office just the other day to go through this. Now, I said, now, and I'd already gotten her history, but I said, did you ever have PID? No. Did you ever have an episode of fever and pain in your stomach? No. Ever have chlamydia or gonorrhea? No. Been married for several years. Uh, she said, you know, I did have abortion uh, a few years ago, uh, back before we got married, and it wasn't a convenient time. And could that have done it? And I said, well, I don't know. Sure, you could have gotten infected then. But this woman had gotten a chlamydia or gonorrhea, never had any fever or pain or discomfort. It had totally destroyed her female organs. And I had to sit there and tell her that she was totally sterile. And these tubes are so bad, there's no way that with microsurgery I could fix them. Did you tell me that the average woman who gets AIDS has had sex with only two men? Did well, I understand you correctly? Uh, this past few weeks, I've read two reports that said that in women who had AIDS, one of them said 42% of those women said that they had, as far as I knew, two sexual partners in the past. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as a result of that, of course, AIDS is dramatically increasing in women. Now, the other startling thing about this was in an associated report, it also said that the women who were told they had AIDS were not changing their sexual practices, that they were denying that they had it. About 30 or 40 percent of them were continuing to have sex with the men they were with or changing partners and having sex with other men and not telling them. Now, there's a, uh, an incubation period of anywhere from several months to 15 years for AIDS. Yeah. But when you carry that virus, even if you don't yet have AIDS, you are contagious for that disease. Is that correct? That's correct. Did you all hear what he said? Because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. When a person is infected with HIV, that's the AIDS virus, HIV-1, which is a common one in this country, from the time they get infected, they, from that point on, are infectious to anybody they have sex with, including the person in the future they might want to marry. Mm. To every person, okay? And AIDS, for you, if you get it, is a death sentence, period. 100% fatal. It's a 100% fatal disease. There is no cure that's even on the horizon. We still hear a lot about drugs. There's no drug that's even close to curing it. We hear a lot about vaccine. Uh, I just read a report, as a matter of fact, again, during the past few weeks, that said that when the AIDS virus gets into your body, it changes into so many different types of viruses just in you that there's no way to make a, a vaccine against all those viruses in an individual person. It's a terribly complex virus. Let me tell you, for an example, uh, herpes has been around now for, for several years. Uh, I wrote another book back in about 1984. And in that book, I said they're working on a herpes vaccine right now. It looks like it'll be on the market in the next year or two. We still haven't seen anything of a herpes vaccine, and that thing is a thousand times easier to get a vaccine for than AIDS ever will be. The thing I'd like for you all to understand, uh, and I am, a, in a sense, a scientist. I guess you'd consider physicians that to some extent. Science does not have the answer for this. If you watch the newspapers, every time you read about these infections and these diseases, they'll say, well, science is going to come up with a vaccine. Uh, we're going to get the public health departments tracing these infections, and we're going to find a cure, and we're going to find a solution. The solution for these diseases is not going to be in science ever. Now, let me give you an example. Syphilis today is at a 40-year high, as we mentioned a while ago. 
The syphilis organism is totally 100% susceptible to penicillin. It is always cured with a shot of penicillin, and yet we're losing the battle. It's almost terrifying to the public health officials to see what's happening with congenital syphilis in this country. The solution is not in science, and don't ever start looking for the solution in science. It can help you if you have a specific problem temporarily, but it cannot cure the problem. Do you all see why we get hot about this subject and why it's irritating to see people your age being given the safe sex message only without this other information? Uh, this is not said. It's not in the women's magazines for the most part. It's not on television. It's not in the textbooks. And it's more or less being withheld. And I'm not sure why other than the things that we talked about before. Uh, let me give you all an opportunity to ask questions of Dr. McElhaney and uh, we'll start right there. Why do schools tell us to use uh, condoms when they know they're only 90% or they say 90% effective? When we're dealing with 100% deadly disease, abstinence is never taught. I really think that they think you're going to have sex anyway. They think that they can cut the number of people who get AIDS and get chlamydia down if, if a big group will use them more. But it's almost like they're pushing us to do it. They don't, they don't say, don't do it. They just say, use condoms. You know, you know I read a, re a, a statistic. Tim, I don't know if you've seen this or not. But uh, I read a statistic that said that of uh, people who are being taught the way you're saying that you're taught in schools the traditional way about using condoms and safe sex, that per thousand people there are about 125 more pregnancies per year than there were where that education ever even got started because it seems even to stimulate uh, sexual activity. Maybe it makes people feel complacent that they can't be hurt and they go ahead and have sex when otherwise they wouldn't. The incredible thing is that Planned Parenthood and organizations like that are given $150 million in federal money each year to tell you about safe sex and the distribution of condoms. And everywhere they uh, function, the incidence of sexual activity goes up. The incidence of pregnancy and abortion goes up. That's right. Uh, the, it, it does, every time. The uh, incidence of birth goes down. Guess why? Abortions. Abortion. Yeah. Right there. Are there any of these diseases you've been talking about that can be caught without sexual contact? They can be caught without sexual contact. Of course, we all know that you can be infected with AIDS from a blood transfusion. Um, healthcare workers like me who operate, who get blood through their gloves, can get infected from that. Uh, you can perhaps pick the HPV organism up and some others from some mucus that might be left on a toilet seat or things like that. But let me just be real clear with you. These infections we're talking about, the ones we've talked about to this point, are sexually transmitted almost 99% of the time. The problem, the epidemic, is not from anything really except the sexual activity that's going on in our country right now among single people. Joe, do you worry about the surgery that you're doing uh, with the rampant uh, spread of these diseases? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I have blood through my glove at least 10 to 15 percent of the time after I operate. And if I have a hangnail or if I have a cut or a little rash on my finger, there's no question that AIDS and virus can infect me too. And I've told Mary it's very likely that I'll get AIDS sometime before I quit practice. You really have faced that? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a reality. Uh, now, let me tell you what they're telling us to do is to wear two gloves. A report came out of California again just recently that said wear two gloves. A surgeon about 15% of the time is going to have a, a tear in a glove and if he wears two gloves he's going to only find blood on his finger through both gloves 7% of the time. Now you tell me what does that say about condoms? Okay, mm -hmm. Gloves are manufactured for <coughs> surgical perfection and yet they say use condoms to be safe. Okay right here. I was I wanted to ask you about the possibility of getting AIDS from your dentist like the lady did down in Florida and um, exactly what are the effects of heavy petting? The chance of getting AIDS from a health worker is extremely, extremely small. I really think statistics show only uh, even less than 10 people in the whole United States that have gotten it from their health care worker from a physician or from a dentist. So that's very likely. I would pick a physician or a dentist. Uh, thought was good and had clean instruments. Apparently this dentist didn't even clean instruments between patients. So it's really important to pick a dentist that you think really does have good, good technique, a physician too. The problem with heavy petting is that it leads straight to intercourse. 
That's the way physiologically we're made. Heavy petting is a preliminary activity for intercourse. And I'd say that'd be the danger there. If I can add to that, I mentioned uh, this morning when we were talking about pornography that it was progressive. Remember, it doesn't stay in one place. All sexual activity is like that. When you're first dating, just taking hold of a girl's hand is stimulating. But it won't be for very long. Four or five days or a week or two weeks later, your arm is around her. And the longer you're together, there's greater familiarity, and familiarity breeds. And that's moving someplace. It's moving in the direction of sexual intercourse. Physiologically, we're taken in that direction. If you guys could remember nothing else that I say, I hope you hang on to this, that if you've made up your mind to be moral, if you've made up your mind to do what God wants, and you're determined to do it, there is a second step you have to take, and that is to slow down those intimacies in the early stage of the relationship, or else the last step will occur, and it's only one half inch to sexual relationships. You see what I mean? If you don't slow it down here in the front of the relationship, then you will inevitably move in that direction. Uh, I saw some statistics that show that by the time you have spent 300 hours together, even if you're committed to abstinence, you're likely to be in bed with each other because the time together creates intimacy. So it is so important if you really want to do what God wants, right from the beginning you, you attempt to slow down that physical contact. I right? absolutely agree with that. Right there. I, I know that a lot of um, venereal diseases affect future children of the women. I was wondering if the HPV affects the children if they are, in fact, able to conceive. Uh, it can, in some babies, cause little nodes on the baby's vocal cords. That doesn't sound too bad, except that the baby then has to be treated by an expert for that purpose. It can be a very damaging thing to the baby's vocal cords. It's a, sort of a scary infection for a child to have. Joe, uh, l yes, let sir. me ask you one uh, that I feel strongly about. For centuries, maybe from the beginning of the human family almost, women have sought to protect themselves from sexual exploitation because there's been a common understanding in the culture that women have the most to lose. They're the only ones that get pregnant. Uh, they are more likely to suffer from these diseases that we're talking about. And also, because men and women differ, uh, men tend to give intimacy in order to get sex. Women tend to give sex in order to get intimacy. So after a one-night stand or a brief encounter, the man walks away having gotten what he wanted, which was the sexual experience. The woman walks away having not gotten what she wanted, which was intimacy, and she loses emotionally and physically. That was understood. That's why I have felt that the sexual revolution that swept this country in the late 60s and we're still involved in is the biggest joke men ever played on women to make them feel like that there is no reason for this difference in the way the sex act is seen. Comment on that. The chief of the CDC, Centers for Disease Control from Atlanta, in 1985 was given a lecture. He said, I don't see why the women of America don't stand up and scream about this problem. Now, I don't want to produce problems between men and women, okay? Uh, because the electricity there is what makes things go around. But there is no question that men are made with testosterone. They're made aggressive. It takes a certain aggressiveness to have the audacity to ask a woman to have an intimacy as close as sexual intercourse. Men are made that way, and, and God made us that way because if men weren't made that way and women weren't made to respond, we wouldn't have babies and the human race would end. But that's clearly out of control. Uh, let's talk a little bit about date rape. That's, that's another great concern of mine. It, it really is a major concern of mine. I, I'll be uh, real straightforward with you, Jim, and with all you. I consider it a, an absolute criminal rape when a man forces himself on a woman, even if it's in a dating situation, uh, even if it's in a, an apartment, and even if the girl 
you know, has been maybe more open with a guy than she ought to be. It's a rape if that guy forces her to have sex and she says stop at any point. How before common that is that? Date rape is extremely common. Uh, I've read statistics, again, these vary a lot, but at least 20% of girls that had sex the first time had it as an actual rape, where, where they were really, literally forced, held down and forced to have sex. 20% uh, of the 20 time? 20%. And that at least 50% of the girls, when they had sex the first time, had it because they were made drunk or were, were put into a situation where they just literally couldn't escape from it without having sex. Uh, the statistics are pretty strong. And I have some real specific recommendations to women especially that if you're going to be dating, date somebody uh, with other couples in a protected environment, don't get into a compromising situation with a guy. Now, how, how do these women protect themselves? as they go into college. I mean, up to 50% are in some kind of coercive situation, and you don't know that. That's you right. can't read the temperament of the guy till it's too late. Uh, single dating almost looks like uh, you're asking for it. That's right. It, it can be. But yeah. there can be some ways that women can be more suggestive with men, and they just need to be careful about that. We're also talking now about doubling up on some of these addictive doors. That's right. Where you, you double up on premarital sex and alcohol. What's that do? That's really hard to come up with statistics, but I think most people that have looked at those statistics would say that where alcohol and drugs are involved, that uh, the sexual activity dramatically increases. Because the inhibitions are because down. Because inhibitions are down. And, so if uh, a guy can get a girl to drink a little bit, you know, and I, I don't want to put all uh, the blame on the guys. We're being pretty hard on the guys here, but the, the other half of it is that women are more aggressive now than they've ever been before. Well, again, I read a study just a year or two ago that guys had had sex the first time they had sex. Um, a great number of them were made to feel like if they didn't have sex with a girl, the girl was really given the come on, that there was something wrong with them. They were weird or they were homosexual or something wimp. was going on with them. They were wimp if they didn't have sex. And getting manipulated into having intercourse with a girl that was really obviously very experienced and very pushy. I have people come into my office over and over and over again, uh, people your age, uh, people in their 20s that are single, parents of people your age, parents of younger people who all say, isn't this really scary? And I bet that you've thought the same thing yourself. Isn't it scary? I just like to say that you can start feeling so burdened by this whole problem that it sort of makes it seem that sex probably will never be any good. What's your husband going to be like? Your wife going to be like? What kind of experiences they had? Is everybody going to have these diseases by the time you get to the point of being married? First, I'd like to say, of course, the ideal is uh, without question that you not have sex before you get married and that your husband or wife not have sex either. And believe me, that is reasonable. I'm seeing a huge increased number of people that come into my office in the past year or two who have never had sex. Believe me, there are lots of people And they're no out longer there. embarrassed about it. And they're no longer embarrassed about it. I'll see them go to other physicians who will call them sweet little girl and things like that that infuriates me. So there are physicians that will act like it's not normal. Believe me, it's normal not to have sex until you get married. Lots and lots of people, especially the past year or two, and that's not going to harm message, you. And it ain't going to harm you at all. You know, I think that there has to come a decision time in everybody's life, and I hope you're seeing this as a decision time. That if you are involved sexually with somebody, you can secondary. be a secondary virgin. You can experience secondary virginity. Now, that's a really powerful idea because. A person can start feeling like, well, if, had, if they've had sex before, you know, and we're talking about all this stuff, why not just go ahead? You know, you've already started, you changed sexual partners, you might as well go ahead and se have sex with the next guy or girl, too. But those continued experiences are what produce even more emotional and spiritual and physical disease in a person. So make a choice right now, if you ever start going with another person, not to have sex with them. Become a secondary virgin. You not only become a secondary virgin physically, yeah. but spiritually you become a primary virgin right. because the Lord will forgive any sin. And not only forgive it, but remember it against you no more forever as far as the east is from the west. That's good news. It washes it? you white as snow. And that's something we can, ha we can hardly understand as human beings. But Christ literally washes us white as snow and can wash you and me because I've committed sins all of us have. That's why we have Christ, but he can cleanse us of all that past. I have a letter here that came from uh, a 15-year-old girl that really does break my heart. 
and I'm getting a large amount of mail like this. Listen to this. This is fairly short. I'm a 15-year-old girl, and I'm still a virgin. I want to know what sex is like, and I don't think I can wait till I'm married. I have managed all these years to say no with the help of God. She's 15 years old, and she's managed all these years. You see what I'm talking about, folks? You see why I talk about the pressure on this hallway? It's not just a stroll down there. I mean, there is tremendous pressure to open these doors. She's 15. She probably means since she's 12, she's been under this kind of pressure. Um, right now, there isn't a guy pressuring me in to have sex with him, but I was thinking about saying yes the next time. I know I will feel guilty for this sin, but I don't think I can hold up any longer. I know I can get VD or AIDS or get pregnant, but I'll pray that that won't happen. <laughs> See, that's called a presumptuous prayer. Uh, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. You can't say, Lord, I want to sin, but I don't want to face the consequences. I know also that God sees all, and what is done in secret will be revealed. I don't know what to do. Then your heart go out to this young lady. It really does. The, the sad thing about that is if someone starts having sex when they're 15, 16, 17, 18, along in those ages, the number of sexual partners they have is tremendously higher. I mean, like among 45% of them, if they've had started having sex in those ages, they'll end up usually by the age of 24 having at least four or five, six sexual partners. Statistics show that. It's terrible to start having sex at that age. Right down here. Do you believe AIDS and the HPV virus are punishment from God for man's immoralness? I personally don't believe that God brought those in and used them as a club to beat people with. See, my picture of God is a God that loves us so much that He literally gave His Son, Jesus Christ, for us. And in that love for us, He gave us the Bible to lay out, in essence, a, a, a road map to life. Sort of like a map to a minefield. If, if you were uh, approaching a minefield and somebody gave you a map that said go forward 15 yards and to the right 15 yards and this way, you get through without getting your legs blown off. And the scripture is so right in what it says. Just in this area, it says don't have sex except with your wife or with your husband ever. Stay with them through your whole life. And if we do that, these diseases don't have to be scary at all. Think of the significance of that, folks. The God that created mountains and streams and little babies and love and happiness and every good thing on the face of the earth, every creative, wonderful thing on the earth, that God has given us a prescription for healthy living. And you dare not defy it. And why wouldn't we live by it? Because science now shows that it is absolutely valid and true. I want to tell you something science can't tell you. My wife and I, Shirley, were virgins when we got married. I thank the Lord for that. Both of us. And we've been faithful to each other all the way through. We've been married 31 years. There's never been anybody else in either of our lives. It is a closed relationship. There are no other viruses. There are no other bacteria. There's no other sin. It's exclusive. And at this stage of my life, I cannot tell you how I value that and what that means. We have something exclusively with one another that no one else has ever participated in. It is priceless. Don't throw it away. Don't throw it away. We're talking here about diseases. There's something even more important than the physical aspect of this, and that is the the spiritual aspect, our relationship with God and our relationship in marriage with one another. Don't throw it away for five minutes in the back seat of a car. Last week I asked Mary if I could say that same thing about us and she said I could, <laughs> that we, neither one, ever had sex with anybody before and haven't since. And uh, for 31 years we've had a life that's had a relationship of trust and, and belief in each other that's based on that. Now, the problem with saying that is for you that have had sex, you can sort of say, well, that means I'll never quite have as good a life as, as they might have had. And that's where the faith in, in a God that loves you is so important because he really does do that cleansing that we were talking about a while ago. Do you all have the courage the next time a teacher begins talking to you about safe sex to take them on? Yes. Are you armed with enough information to deal with it? to deal with your friends, 
You all can make a difference. You can help bind them together. The price for all of this will be very high, but I guarantee you it's worth the cost. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate you being here.